Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on time. Today, I want first to ask you if you have any questions or comments in regards to the film that we watched on Friday since there was no time left at the end of the segment. And I did also have to cut the segment short, so I'll add a few words about the plot of the movies, the movie, just in case uh, you are curious. Then my goal for this morning is twofold. One is to complete the analysis of chapter seven of The Prince to present a series of relevant, interesting passages in chapter eight, and chapter eight is strongly connected to chapter seven. In fact, at the end, towards the end of that chapter, you find a commentary by Machiavelli about cruelty, which is clearly the key to the understanding, to the proper understanding of chapter seven. The same way that the chapters leading to chapter seven, five and six, about leadership, about skills being in demand in a certain context, were preliminary to, were an introduction to the chapter on Cesare Borgia, allegedly the best possible example of perfect leadership that Machiavelli could uh, find. I'm curious to know whether you want also to include a discussion about last night at the Oscar and the Will Smith incident, because I think a Machiavellian analysis would be perfectly appropriate. But I don't know if any of you watched it. I know the Oscars are not very popular, and especially in your, your age group. But after we talk about the movie, if you want, we can digress in that uh, direction. Okay, so point number one, the film. If you were in class on Friday you, and you, you watched the segments, the episodes we, where we followed Tom Ripley killing Dickie Greenleaf, then going back to the hotel and once again taking the opportunity without apparently much planning of impersonating Dick, Dickie Greenleaf simply because the concierge at the hotel mistakes one American for the other, believes uh, Tom uh, to be Dickie. We, we follow Tom in Rome, where he for once established a series of duplicitous, uh, apparently Machiavellian plans to confirm the existence of Dickie, to uh, provide false evidence that Dickie Greenleaf is still alive and in contact with different people, with Tom himself and with Meredith, who doesn't know who Dickie really is and believes Tom to be Dickie. And then finally we saw Tom renting an apartment in Rome and living a good life, uh, playing the piano, devoting himself to creative, uh, the creative endeavor of, of music and joining the arts in Rome, etc. until Freddie, Dickie's friend, comes over and is suspicious from the very beginning. He doesn't trust uh, Tom and he makes no mystery of that, doesn't hide that. And during the following conversation, which we had to cut short, Freddie will accuse Tom of hiding the truth about Dickie and Tom will have to kill Dickie with the very sculpture, the classical sculpture that he bought for the apartment where he is imagining his new life as a wealthy American enjoying the Italian experience. Following this, there will be, of course, an inquiry by the Italian police. Tom will be interrogated, will find himself in a difficult 
situation, he will then leave Rome and go to Venice as he had promised, because in Venice, of course, he can find Peter, the man he met at the theater who expressed an interest, encouraged Tom to visit him in Venice and even left his business card with his telephone number uh, to uh, Tom. Uh, a friendship will be established there between Peter and uh, Tom. Marge will come into the story again and the suspicion will grow that Dicky has killed himself. This thanks also to one of the forgeries done by Tom based on the fact that Dicky used to send out letters just using his typewriter, so all Tom has to do is falsify the uh, signature with the first name uh, at the end of the letter. At the end of the movie, we find Tom and Peter, who have uh, started a, a romantic relationship on a uh, cruise ship going back to the US and apparently happy. Uh, apparently Tom finds some stability, some form of balance in his romantic life with Peter. However, once again, Tom is about to be discovered, is about to be found out because Meredith and her parents are on the ship and he cannot maintain this double identity. Peter knows Tom as Tom, Meredith knows Tom as Dickie, and they're on the same ship, they're both in first class, meeting the same people, so it's only a matter of time before Tom gets found out, and even though Tom is more attached to Peter, he decides to kill Peter because he cannot eliminate Meredith and her parents, that would be costlier, that would be more difficult to cover, etc. And so going against his feelings, his very feelings, Tom will kill Peter and will continue on his life of deceit and impersonation. And as you remember, this is the first of five books by Patricia Highsmith about the same uh, character and many movies have been made, especially on uh, the talented Mr. Ripley, starting with uh, Purple Noon, 1965, a French movie with Alain Delon, um, which you can also find on Amazon Prime, and up to Ripley's Game from 2002, directed by famous Italian director Liliana Cavani. And in fact, I've decided this Friday, why not compare uh, Cavani's Ripley with Minghella's Ripley, so this Friday we will watch a few scenes from uh, Ripley's game, okay? That was the summary of what we watched, the summary of the conclusion of the movie, just to introduce any comments and start a limited discussion on the film itself, your reactions, your questions, of course, etc. The floor is yours. Yes, please. Um, so, Tom Ripley, like, you, I think I read somewhere in, like, Honolulu's online that he's, like, truly Machiavellian, but, like, I feel like, I guess it doesn't, it didn't matter when they're on the boat that he, like, lost control of his emotions because no one else was around to witness it, you know? Mm -hmm. But... I feel like just like the use of force and like that he did lose control, like kind of makes him not. But we can say like coexist the like indirect and the force. Yeah, no, you're very right that on one hand we see the character of Tom Ripley losing control and being quite impulsive. On the other hand, we can consider 
his use of force, the principal instrument he deploys in order to establish and maintain control, right? Both on the boat, when he goes out at sea with Dicky Greenleaf in Sanremo at the end, and what, when what, what was supposed to be the end of, of their friendship, of their uh, good time in Italy, and then, as I said, in the apartment in Rome, when under a barrage of questions by Freddie Miles, who's coming very close to the truth, he uh, uh, resorts to violence once again and kills um, Freddie. The same can be said about Peter, right? When he kills Peter at the end, that's the only way he sees out of a messy situation where he is about to lose the control he has of the situation because there are people who know, uh, who can reveal his double identity. So, as I said at the beginning, overall, the best way to qualify Ripley as Machiavellian is this time to resort to the traditional psychological definition of Machiavellian as it is conceived within the so-called dark triad of psychopaths in psychology where the dark triad is narcissism, being a, a sociopath and being Machiavellian. Okay, so from that point of view, from the point of view of psychology, and there are plenty of articles on this, and then the dark triad has become famous, although it's all over the internet. It's, for example, a big part of the discussions in the so-called manosphere and the red pill, if you're familiar with that. If you're not familiar, don't bother. Yes. But, uh, uh, and it's falling out of fashion anyway. Um, but from the standpoint of our understanding of what it means to be Machiavellian, founded on a system, a schema, uh, extrapolated from the prince, we said he's not really Machiavellian because he reacts, he's mostly reactive. Every time he deploys violence, it's simply an immediate reaction, and every time, at least in this film, he uh, um, acts duplicitous is in reaction to, uh, in response to an opportunity that presents itself, is not the result of planning. And from this point of view, Michael Corleone or Don Vito Corleone are more Machiavellian than Tom Ripley uh, will ever be in this film. And the other thing is that within a Machiavellian framework, uh, control of one's emotions is key to a fault. Because if one well-founded accusation and criticism can be levied at Machiavelli is in reference to the fact that he conceives of the prince as someone who cannot be a violent beast because otherwise he will give in to his impulses when he should act uh, as a cool uh, a leader and present himself with a positive image so that, that his subjects will uh, uh, have confidence in, in uh, him. And the other problem, the other issue that we can see with Machiavelli from a more modern standpoint, having learned about Freud and the subconscious and, and post-traumatic stress disorder, is that Machiavelli thinks that you can just turn a switch and go from being an animal to being a human, from using your mind to using your body, from using your influence to using your force without any consequences, that whenever it is necessary, force will be deployed by the leader directly or indirectly. And then that has to be timed, that has to be a temporary strategy because you cannot continue, the continued use of force is too expensive and um, well, you, you will at some point hit a wall, meaning that you cannot kill everyone, right? You have at some point to be able to transition to um, influence and authority, but we know that 
anyone involved in a violent practice, in a prolonged violent behavior, will oftentimes carry the consequences, the long-term consequences, the psychological uh, uh, consequences of that violent, even when that violence is apparently justified. Cops, soldiers, oftentimes, uh, after serving long enough, will uh, uh, often uh, suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder because it is impossible. There is no such switch that tells you, now you're violent, now you're cool, you're, you're fine, you can go back to uh, being normal. Uh, the, the, these two compartments uh, are, uh, in, in fact, uh, profoundly uh, connected. Uh, whereas Machiavelli had this classical view of the relationship of the animal in humans and the intellectual part in humans, where the intellectual part is the higher power that can control the beastly instincts, is to be aware that there are beastly instincts. It is necessary for Machiavelli's view of the human uh, as a whole it is necessary to be aware that you are part animal, part force, part body, and part mind, elevated being, spiritual being, but at the same time, the spiritual being is in charge and therefore can control, can have absolute control over the animal, release the animal force, the brutality, then control, withdraw those forces, control them, and continue on the spiritual side. So. From this point of view, uh, the character of Ripley in Minghella's film is a complete mess, right? In, in terms of control or lack thereof. So uh, I agree fundamentally with the objections you, you, you raise. Would anyone like to uh, expand also or, or intervene or we can move to a different point in the film? We're discussing the film we watched since there wasn't time for a proper discussion on Friday, before we forget about the film. And any other reactions also to the film in general? It is a film we don't have to discuss just the Machiavellian part of the character. Yes, Christina. Something that um, kind of struck me about, uh, about Tom is that he's kind of almost fundamentally unsuited to his environment. Just um, I mean, per, like not just in terms of the background, but temperament, where he's like like constantly interacting with his environment and the people around him, but does not actually have the emotional balance needed to successfully pull off all of that. It's kind of Shakespearean how, like, say, Hamlet and Othello are fundamentally mm -hmm. wrong for the <laughs> places and moments they're in. Yeah, yeah, I like that that connection. What what strikes me as wrong in the overall approach to the story is that, as I said, whereas in the book, uh, Ripley is more or less a hustler from the very beginning, an imposter, in the film is not enough of an imposter. He's not really pretending enough, yes. right? So when Freddy says, oh, look at him, he's wearing a corduroy jacket in Italy, that tells everything about the character. His goofy is awkward, is a fish out of water, meaning that he would like to be part of, the, of this glitzy uh, uh, group, uh, uh, class of wealthy people, without making an effort to pretend to be one. And is passive aggressive, even in his pretense to be like Dickie, in that instead of conning his way or stealing uh, a, a, an elegant suit or the proper attire for uh, a, a young American vacationing on the shores of Campania, on the Amalfi Coast, instead of doing that and, and coming up with a facade that looks the part, he's uh, putting on Dickie's suits and, and the rings and, and doing the voices, right? Uh, so it, 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 it confined... His impostorship is confined to his own inner world. And what he projects outside is the goofy, awkward exterior that 
doesn't, that is not really believable, unless you think of this as part of a very duplicitous plan, whereas uh, the same way that Robert Greene will tell you, uh, look dumber, uh, that he looks more naive, more innocent, and no one will believe that he's a con man exactly because of his goofiness. But I don't think the movie wants to convey that. I, I think the movie wants to convey the fact that evil uh, uh, at its worst is a, a sociopath that is so impulsive and so narcissist that you never know what he will do next. And by portraying him Tom, as a bad imposter, the message is that the worst form of evil is a, someone who has no dignity. So you're only repulsed by Tom. You're, you're never, in, in, in my view, when you're watching that movie, you're never at a point where you admire uh, Ripley for his cunning ability to dece deceive others which is something that instead it's supposed to happen between you and the character in Liliana Cavani's 2002 Ripley's Game movie, where of course you find John Malkovich. And John Malkovich is, is masterful, uh, is a master at that kind of ambiguity where you feel that you should be scared of him, but there is something, the subtle kind of power that uh, uh, makes him captivating. Right? and powerful, and therefore there is the basis, the very premise to a kind of empathy between the viewer and the character, whereas it's hard to empathize with Tom at all, right? You see him struggle, and then you see him explode in violence, and you just see basically a sociopath, the very essence of a, a sociopath, and of, of that kind of criminal, don't, don't you think? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, there's a lot going on there, particularly in kind of evil as sort of this unknowable or undignified thing, because uh, particularly in mainstream movies, there's this tendency to treat evil as, you know, just something other, something that the audience just, would, like, it cannot uh, relate to at all, rather than a product, you know, of our environment. So I guess, you know, a writer that we've talked about, Terry Eagleton, uh, talks about mm -hmm. how when people think about evil, they'll just... Like treated as something like, well, we don't understand this thing, so let's call it evil. Like, um, a police officer looking at a child killing other children, going like, yeah, you know, this person was just born evil, not asking any deeper questions about, say, the context that produced that. I have nothing to do with that. That yeah. could never happen to me. So I have to classify whoever is involved with evil as fundamentally different or an exception, an anomaly, uh, compared to the, the human race of together or human nature. That's very true. At the same time, Hollywood, especially after the period, the, the golden age of drama, which was from the 1930s to the 1950s, where a lot of successful Hollywood movies were dramatic movies without a happy ending, and, and now you hardly find any successful movie without a happy ending of some kind, without a reconciliation uh, of, of, the, of the dissonance at the end. Uh, the way Hollywood uh, uh, maintained a focus on evil was to endow the evil character with some kind of positive uh, uh, quality. Uh, the, described as an exceptional and extraordinary uh, kind of quality in the character, therefore uh, introducing ele an element uh, uh, potentially of respect for the evil character. Through the 1960s was the professional criminal, right? Uh, Frank Sinatra's movies, but also Steve McQueen's movies, the Th Thomas Crown Affair, for example, and others where you find a thief uh, even Cary Grant uh, uh, in Hitchcock movie, um, you find a thief uh, that is so serious about his commitment to thievery or to criminal activities that you have an element that you would like to have yourself applied to uh, more pacific uh, 
and, and regular uh, life and, and professional endeavors. So, uh, especially in combination with the premise of the movie, this will be the last heist. This will be the culmination of a career of thievery, and then the criminal will retire. That is to say, will be reintegrated into regular society. The fact that those crimes are innocent or victimless crimes at best, uh, very wealthy people are the victims, as in the case of Cary Grant uh, uh, stealing in Monte Carlo from very wealthy uh, Americans who are uh, touring the uh, Côte d'Azur, the, 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 the French uh, coast. And then later on, through the James Bond movies especially, and similar in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, you have these masterminds uh, who uh, are very deeply evil and may have some sadistic elements to them, but again, they have extraordinary commitment uh, and extraordinary uh, organizing skills that you, as the, as the viewer, are supposed to appreciate and uh, admire. So there is this element, I know that I'm watching a, a story that is about evil, but it's so far-fetched. Spectre is, is nothing that I could ever achieve, right? The Spectre organization of many, um, bon many of Bond's movies, including No Time to, uh, to Die. So I cannot feel tempted by that. I'm not threatened, my morality, my core uh, is not threatened by the fact that I see uh, uh, someone leading this organization. And at the same time, there is something that I can admire because after all, putting together and leading such an organization requires exceptional uh, skills. And I can see that Chris Walls, the head of Spectre, is, is exceptionally endowed in terms of smarts and general intelligence is not just his malevolence and is quite removed from, usually from direct uh, violence, if not in, in some elaborate ways with some instruments. So it's never uh, Chris Waltz beating someone to uh, a pulp, right? Um, go ahead. It's, it's funny you bring that up because I co-host a podcast about James Bond movies. Okay. Which, um, what do you think? Um, it's, well, we call it human bondage. <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's, that is um, something like about Spectre. Is, it does kind of fall into the outside category because mm -hmm. for most of like the novels, Ian Fleming is you know, just writing about the Cold War. It's like UK right. versus yes. Russia. Mm -hmm. And then, so it's kind of naturalistic politics where you can't really run away. It's just the state of the world as it is. And then he introduces Spectre, which is kind of that whole um, Machiavellian outside mastermind aspect, which kind of distorts everything, because the books are already surreal up to that point. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from then, well, like, you get into Spectre, which kind of the movies take after, it, it kind of gains that fantastical aspect of like evil and strategy is something kind of glamorous and external to what people actually do. Yes, it, it doesn't seem to come out of society or, or uh, the, the social and political infrastructure, but that's a, a fallback to the situations you find in 19th century novels, especially Jules Verne, where you find these evil masterminds such as Robur in Robur the Conqueror and the Master of the World, uh, where uh, uh, he has this organization, he has these powerful technologies, yet He's not coming out of the industrial mm. setting of society. No one knows where he uh, comes from and becomes parallel to society. And, 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 and you can draw a line from there to Austin Powers. Yes. <laughs> evil, <laughs> the, the Dr. Doctor, Doctor evil, uh, right? That's basically uh, the, the, the yeah. comedic version of Jules Verne's uh, character. Don't forget the other fascinating aspect of the books by Ian Fleming is not just the, the Cold War setting, but also the strong belief that there is a racial component yeah. to good and evil, where especially in the first books, all the evil characters uh, come from certain ethnic groups. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and therefore it's in their nature 
uh, to uh, have behaviors that are not exactly acceptable to the true British gentleman yeah. <laughs> and the honorable member of the empire, of the British empire, right? Yeah, a big part of that whole other aspect is like just taking like racial minorities, uh, women, uh, queer people, like basically all flat yep. villains are yep. like gay or asexual. Yep. So it is a matter of just looking like outside of like kind of the cis heteronormativity whiteness and just going like okay, okay anything that's not this anything that's you know not just like a man and a woman and three kids is an existential threat yeah although although when you talk about family there is no space for families the good oh, yeah. the good times that drive 007 right the, the dinners the drinks etc Edmund you also have to say the thing outside of um, American ethnic groups but so think of all the, like the movies you've seen when the bad character is German and has a German accent mm -hmm. but not in that sense and like even before yeah, World War II yeah, yeah. World War One. so it's just it's um it, it you know it, it's more than um yeah so it basically I'm just trying to say it's like it, it's really wide that so it's you have like the German and then you're like that's the only one I can like, think of, and like, if you think of like Doctor Evil and Austin Powers, it's like okay, or in like the Captain America movies, you know. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a xenophobic component to it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. But doesn't that break down when like a lot of uh, a lot of villains are uh, English these days, like. Um, Yes, that too, because it, it emphasizes, right, the uh, excessive uh, aloofness as an element of sociopathy, as a quick way to characterize someone as a sociopath as not well integrated because they have such a snobbish pose, such a, such a snobbish profile that, they're, that become, they become external to any kind of regular social setting, and therefore you understand how they can be so Machiavellian, so conniving, etc., because both their wealth and their posturing creates a, a distance between them and society, right? So Ben Kingsley playing the part of the evil character uh, in films or in commercials, such as the famous Jaguar commercial that was broadcasted during a Super Bowl a few years ago and then uh, once in a while you still uh, you, you still saw it uh, after that that period right yeah, yeah absolutely mm -hmm. but it's also a way to create the possibility for empathy between the viewer and the character because instead of portraying someone uh, who is evil as as a beast they make this character heavy on the intellectual side. Someone whose balance between body and mind falls more on the side of the mind. So they're cold and intellectual at the same time. They seem to have a, uh, ex an extremely developed intellect. And that is supposed to create the possibility of some admiration, at least temporary admiration before they uh, go through uh, their their plans, right? Because they seem to be so in control. Do you have some specific example in mind from films? From films of, uh, like, like an English... Uh, Star Wars, sir. Star Wars. There's, um, mm -hmm. I guess it's thinking of the Sherlock, all the Sherlock Holmes series. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. A couple of examples in Marvel that I guess I'm missing out on. Okay. I mean, we all know the English are just evil. <laughs> Anyone else? Questions, comments, going back, especially to Tom Ripley's character? I mean, wasn't Dickie? I mean, Dickie's played by... Uh, Jude, Jude Law. Jude Law, yeah. And he's kind of, he's not a very, like, admirable person. I mean, I can kind of understand why. <laughs> so, you feel that it's easy to... Uh, criticize the character of Dicky as it is played by by Jude. Or? Yeah, a little bit. Uh -huh. It's just he's not like as much as he's not likable. No, right. But one of the themes of the movie is bored rich people. Remember, in in the part we watched on Friday, you have that memorable dialogue between Meredith 
and Tom Ripley on the Spanish steps in Rome, where they're going down and then into the uh, American Express office to get money out of their accounts. And she says, it's easier for rich people to uh, connect to other rich people because we're rich and we despise our wealth. And no one else will understand this, that we can be wealthy, we can have everything and be bored and despise the circumstances in our lives. Uh, and, and regular people don't understand how this is possible, right? So it's a, I, I think it's a very important point. Uh, in, in the back, I'm sorry. You're, your name? Carissa. Okay. Um, so I thought it was like funny because so when Vicky says he's going to see you with like Marge. Yeah, Marge. He's like um Tom Ripley's like, Oh, now you love Marge, like you were just with all of those women, like but like now you love her. Yes. And like You want to marry her? Yeah. And it's like funny because like what he's saying like is true yeah but he's like manipulating so like yeah. it's like is that right or is it like you know what i mean like we know what he's why he's saying that like because he doesn't have his like moral like, yes it's paradoxical he's like oh well like he's like accusing him of not having them well he doesn't have them himself but it's like still true what you're saying, you know? Like, yeah, no, it's a legitimate criticism. You uh, you had a relationship with Silvana and, and Silvana was pregnant and then Silvana killed herself in, in, in the film and uh, you have other affairs, yet you want to marry Marge. And of course, Tom, is once again a fish out of water when he says that, meaning he doesn't understand the logic, the standards of the upper class where you marry someone who's proper for your class, who comes from a proper family, who can be properly introduced and displayed in society as a wife. Marge fits uh, that uh, profile. And then you have sexual liaisons or even true love in other areas of your life. They're reserved to other areas uh, of your life. Tom cannot conceive uh, of, of this way of living. In a way, he's idolizing um, Dickie, you know, right? And would like Dickie to be, uh, to be perfect. And, and then, of course, uh, he, from, from that scene, you, you feel that uh, Tom wants to be loved uh, by by Dickie, right? So there is this kind of innocence uh, at play in the first part uh, of of the film, which is kind of exaggerated compared to the uh, literary version of the character. Yes, Carissa. I just want to respond to your point because yeah, that was really that, that was really important. Um, what you're saying about like what him being like partially right because something that you know abusers and narcissists often do is they'll they'll ground excuse me they'll ground their bullshit in like with just a grain of truth enough truth to like keep the victim buying what they're selling and it kind of distorts everything around them and kind of makes the victim more vulnerable to that abuse and that gaslighting yeah. so just kind of that sort of machiavellian abuse almost or like maybe not not necessarily for him in this context until he murders him murdering people is not nice <laughs> but like uh, but but so the way the way some of those same principles apply is really interesting yes it's an interesting possibility yeah tom is trying to manipulate uh, although in a very crude way trying to manipulate dickie the problem is that the manipulation skills of tom in the film are rather limited and his attempts are a bit uh, childish at that as if he didn't understand that he's just a toy to, to Dickie, uh, just a, being treated as a social parasite. I, I cannot find a better definition for uh, the role of Tom in uh, Dickie's life. Someone who enjoys the benefits of Dickie's wealth and makes him laugh, keeps him entertained, and therefore at some point 
or not, you grow bored, grow bored, you get bored and discard the new found toy. Okay, so well, uh, uh, it, it was a pleasure to to hear you uh, express a variety of opinions on the film and other stuff, uh, and that's great. Let's go back to my proposition. Did you watch the Oscars? Would you like to talk about Will Smith <laughs> from a Machiavellian standpoint? I find it fascinating. I couldn't I, stop I, uh, thinking uh, about it. Okay? So I, I see from the reaction that there are enough people who watched it. For those who didn't watch it, what happened? Did anyone not watch it or not know about this? Of course, it's trending, but do you want me to summarize what happened? Sure. Okay. So. Towards the end, the end of the of the of the Oscar, Chris Rock, the black comedian, was uh, brought on stage in order to introduce uh, a minor award, uh, the Oscar for best uh, documentary, and they gave him more space. It was like uh, of enough space for a traditional comedic monologue of the kind you would have expected during Oscar nights, where the presenter makes fun of the audience, even in a cruel way. And uh, towards the beginning of his uh, piece, uh, Chris Rock directed his attention to Will Smith and Jada Pinkett sitting next to each other and made a joke at Jada Pinkett's shaved head. Jada Pinkett, suffering from alopecia, decided to shave her head and went public about this, about the fact that he, she was first trying to cover the symptoms of her condition and then decided to embrace uh, her uh, new look. And Chris Rock made a G.I. Jane uh, uh, joke, G.I. Jane being a semi-famous my successful film with Demi Moore from 20 years ago, where Demi Moore was playing the part of a female soldier with shaved head. And he said, oh, by the way, Jada, uh, G.I. Jane 2, uh, uh, I, I loved you in it, and um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing the film when it comes out, at which point Will Smith got up from his seat, walked to Chris Rock, who paused and put his hands behind it, which is something that then has puzzled since last night everyone because what happened looked half staged and half real. He put his hands behind him like this with the microphone, <laughs> somewhat waiting for a reaction, and Will Smith with big strides went there and in a very theatrical way slapped it and it, the, the, the sound was like you when you have an accident right and you hear this boom and you think oh the back of my car is is destroyed and was just a fender bender right from that point on the oscars muted the sound but everyone knows from uh, the australian version uh, yeah. and, among others evidently that circulated uh, from last night or from the the interpretation of, of the, the lips, the labial, uh, that after that, uh, Chris Rock said, Will Smith just uh, smashed the, the S, star, star, T, out of me. And Will Smith, who was back in his seat, said twice, uh, keep my wife out of your, of your effing mouth. Uh, and he repeated that while Chris Rock was continuing you know, apparently with a cool demeanor, although right after that, he lost his coolness. He uh, uh, made a mistake, a minor mistake in the following statement. So uh, he was somewhat uh, uh, impacted uh, by uh, this, but only to a degree. So in Machiavellian terms, I, I would ask you, what is the context or the contexts in which this happened, what was deployed by Will Smith, what was uh, deployed or countered with by uh, Chris Rock, what are the consequences in terms of control or 
outcome uh, and power, influence, etc. Nigel. Uh, I'm like, I tend to believe like it wasn't, wasn't stayed because yeah. of that stammer afterwards. Oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's not stayed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Although <laughs> it was part theater, right? Because otherwise, why, why would you would have uh, go like this, saying, <laughs> I'm not going to react, go ahead. Right? It was almost like inviting. So um, the like, question uh, remains, yeah. but what? How would you classify that? Um, okay. To people uh, in, in Machiavellian terms, I mean, not Machiavellian terms, like they're um, they're having competing uh, influence, and that in order to reinforce his own uh, sense of uh, authority, he uh, uses force, direct force against Chris Rock. Yeah, and, uh, I like competing influences. So, Will Smith authority or influence was somewhat at stake, right? He was in the audience mm -hmm. and therefore his control of the situation was at that point within that context zero, yeah. right? As, you, as it is normally the case when you watch a comedy show, yes, you, you can heckle a comedian, you can respond, but the comedian on stage has all the power in the form of influence, right? Because they have the microphone. Yeah. And, and because they usually have the wit. You're, you're not equipped to banter as, as well as they do, right? An actor is not equipped uh, as well as a comedian for, for banter. And it's, uh, it's really bad for uh, Will because in that context, it's, not, it's supposed to be that dynamic where he's supposed to have more influence over you. So what did Will Smith deploy? So instead of using competing influence or authority, right, which would have been in form of a reaction, showing some reaction on his face or saying something, mm -hmm. what did he do? Because that's the important part. So when his left him, what kind of force was it? Was it regular force, full force? It's, it's an interesting form that he used. Teresa? So, like, I think, I feel like that was just like, like, that was just like, Will Smith and his wife, they had like an ongoing, like, very public, you know, there was like a scandal yes. and like. Absolutely. He, he like, loves her and like, he just, forgives her and you know so it's like he uh for the film that he you know got best actor for he i think part of this like tied into that because in his speech like he actually was like what he did on the stage kind of related to what he you know ha in the film how he was like defending his family and like yeah he like, tried to say that yeah probably took that role because he relates to that you know but like i don't know it, but going back to the your, your initial statement in terms of context there are two contexts because you wouldn't understand Will Smith reaction if you first didn't consider the immediate context, no matter how paradoxical it may seem, the context was not really the larger context of the scandal. TV viewership, right? You have, uh, at some point in the past, you would have more than a billion people watching the Oscars worldwide, right? Because it's broadcasted in more than a hundred countries. So the context is not the billion, dollar, the billion viewers, the hundreds of millions of viewers, because otherwise you, you, you lose uh, the, the perspective of uh, what is the goal, what are you trying to control. The immediate context is the relationship between Will and Jada, and Will and Chris, etc. And of course, Chris and Jada, because he attacked her. So 
within this context, Will attacked Chris because he wanted to retain or gain influence over Jada by acting as the savior of her honor, right? Within that context, you see the semblance of a strategy, an attempt to achieve a goal that would justify the slapping, right? And it is only when you consider that this context was almost non-existent, was porous, as porous as you can imagine, because you have cameras, and it's quite a public context, in there you see that it was not a winning strategy, right? Because within that context, you may gain influence within the couple, right? Uh, I've, I've played the part of the husband who defends the honor of his woman. If that is a positive value within your relationship, that kind of traditional uh, model. However, within the secondary, larger and more relevant context, the result is immediate loss of influence and negative effects, negative repercussions on Will Smith's image. Especially since, as I said before, we need to qualify this force and the subsequent reaction. So this was not forced, right? He didn't beat uh, uh, Chris Rock. He didn't uh, uh, throw him to the floor. They, they didn't struggle, right? It was a slap. The slap is traditional symbolic force, right? And a kind of symbolic force related to honor. When was a slap allowed in the past and not returned, not provoking a similar reaction in the past. I'm, I'm talking about several centuries of this tradition well into the 1900s. What was the context? Duels, right? So in the context of uh, uh, bourgeois Western societies of the past, especially as a ritualized practice, in uh, the late 1800s and the early 1900s, a man whose honor was violated by another man will approach his opponent and slap him. And this slap is symbolic. It's not an act of violence. The purpose is not to, de to, to overwhelm physically. The opponent is just to declare, you've been slapped, you've been called to a duel, the slap is the first step, and the next step is we'll see each other with swords or with pistols, and we'll have a duel. And this practice went on in European societies uh, well into the first two or three decades of the 20th century. So it was a symbolic use of force, which is basically a form of deterrence Right? Because it was not real force. Even though the, the sound of the slap w was big, right? And echoed through the theaters and in the TV sets, it was not that kind of force. It was not trying uh, to uh, overwhelm physically the opponent. It was like the first salvo of a military ship that has been sent to. Uh, to, to establish the premise for negotiations in the past, right? Especially in the 19th century when uh, military powers would, colonial powers would send out ships, let's say, to Japan or China in order to impose a certain kind of policy just as a show of force. And in that context, you can shoot a salvo the same way that you should in the air, just to establish that you're not kidding but it's still something that it is in between force and deterrence. It is the highest form of deterrence or the most basic, most preliminary form of force.